story that I'm telling today comes out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, challenge everything I say, and we say this on a regular basis, challenge everything I say with the Word of God, and uh, Luke's Gospel 5, Jesus is ministering, and he's got so many people following him, he had to make a, a, a quick, in football they call it all audible, a change of play in the way he was doing stuff. He was looking around, and he really didn't have room, and so he looked and saw two boats, say two. He had two boats that were sitting there, and the, uh, the fishermen were gone because they were cleaning the nets, the Bible says. And so he went and sat in one and asked Peter, can I use your boat? Can we push out in the water so I can keep teaching? Because the crowds are getting so close they're, that they're literally, you know what I mean? If you've ever been around a lot of people that are getting close, it's the wildest thing. On a side note, the very first time that I went to the Philippines, and we have a lot of Hope Churches in the Philippines, it was a ministry my dad started probably 40 years now, and just with the idea of finding one person who was called into the ministry, put our money, backing them, get them established, and then taking that money and starting with somebody else and getting them to do it. And today there's many, many, many Hope Churches throughout the Philippines. And so long story short, uh, when I was out there ministering for the first time, we had driven way north to an area called Pangasinan, which is very rural. I mean, it... Imagine it, it's, that's the way it was. it was. It was one of those places, and it was so hot. And I was praying for people. We were doing an outdoor crusade. And as uh, we gave an opportunity, if you're sick or in pain, you know, we talked about healing and Jesus healing you, we want to pray for you. And if you're sick and in pain, just stand up. Well, most of them all stood up. So I thought, okay, they didn't understand me. I have an interpreter, but let's try that again. If you are in pain right now, stand up. They all, most of them stood up again. Because in that part of the world, in that part of that area, hospitals and doctors were not like, oh, you're sick, go to a doctor, go to a hospital. There's, there's nothing in that part of the world. Now, not in Manila. Manila is very sophisticated and developed. But in other parts, the Philippines is a very big space. And so I'm like, okay, we'll start praying for people. And we were on this outdoor crusade stage that they had for, it was their, their little community center vibe, and it was outside, and there was probably about six or seven steps, and so people came forward, and I started praying for them. As people started getting healed, they got excited. As they started getting excited, they became, they started pressing closer, and next thing I know, they were not only at the steps, they were coming up to the steps, and before you know it, without me realizing, they were, they were so many people, they were like surrounding me. And near the top of the stage, and right there I had a moment of, I can't breathe. It's the weirdest thing. So many people pressing in literally were taking the oxygen, and we were outside. And so I had to look at the other pastor and say, you need to help me. Let's get these people back a little bit. You start praying, because it was, it was chaos on the good side, I guess. And so I know what it feels like from that perspective. In Jesus' day, there had to be so many people that were pressing up against them. And so he looked at the situation and told Peter, Peter, let me borrow your boat. And Peter launched out. And Peter at that time had been cleaning his nets, struggling, rough day, right? Let's, to bring in some the emotional drama of it, imagine working all nights. If you've never worked a night shift, don't do it. I did it one summer working for a parts depot loading trucks when I was in college. My shift was 1230 at night till 9 in the morning. Horrible. Not of God. Whoever thought of this idea <laughs> is not, I mean... I, I was sleepy when I had to be awake, and I was awake when it was time to go to bed, and I ate when I wasn't hungry, and I was, it was just, your whole body's messed up. I mean, it, so, so Peter's working all night, and he's working hard, but having no success. And if you're a business person or salesperson, you understand the context of working hard, but if you get no sales, you are working for free. And so, it's one thing to be up all night, and boy, do you, you get grumpy. Does anybody get grumpy when you miss your sleep? To work all night can make you grumpy. To work all night missing sleep and not get paid for it? And the only thing that makes that worse is to work, to stay up later after you worked all night hard and not get paid for it because you didn't catch anything, but then have to be cleaning up your mess from working. And that's what Peter's doing. He's cleaning the nets from a long, hard, free payday 
no money, night. What does that mean? If Peter's anything that I can expect from the other stories of Peter, I would know Peter's in a bad mood. I know I would be in a bad mood. And I know most of you would, come on somebody, would be very upset about life about that time and very discouraged and frustrated. And Jesus said, can I borrow your boat? At that point, I would say, you can have it, burn it, take it. I don't want to see it, right? Come on. It's like, sure. And it, Jesus took the boat. He got out there and began to teach and he began to minister. And right there, if, I don't know if it was a knee-jerk decision or if Peter thought about it, but right there, the choice to allow Jesus to use the boat brought Peter into a greater story than he ever imagined. Right there in that moment was when Peter was about to experience Jesus in a way he never see, has seen Jesus. Right there, he was getting his introduction to who Jesus was. Right there in that setting, Peter is about to be invited to go in full-time ministry. So right there, Peter goes from scrubbing his nets, frustrated, exhausted, tired, angry, disappointed, you can keep adding to the list, not knowing that moments away, his world is about to change forever. And if it was a knee-jerk reaction or a thoughtful decision, we don't know, but somewhere he's told Jesus, sure, take it. I'd be like, yeah, whatever, I don't, just get rid of it. And Jesus used it to preach and to teach. But it didn't stop there. Because when God asks us to partner with him to get the gospel out, it never stops there. Let me say that again. When the, when the Lord asks you in any way, shape, or form to partner with him in getting the gospel out, getting the word out, it never stops there. And Jesus said to Peter, most of us know this story, Jesus said to Peter, now I want you to take the net and throw it to the other side because there's going to be some fish. I don't know about you. I'm up all night, worked all night for no pay, I'm frustrated. I want to burn the dumb boat. I want to get into another ministry. I heard Luke's doing good in the medical field and needing some people to help. You know, all these different things. And, and all of a sudden, he says, I want you, you mean, you want me to take that clean net and throw it back into that dirty water? At worst case scenario, that's going to keep me up longer and I have to clean it again. Don't read the Bible as a fairy tale story. Read it as the, uh, a newspaper. So Peter's having to go through this whole process, and he begins to tell Jesus why it's not a good idea. And he says, Lord, we have been toiling, King James. We have been struggling. We have been working exhaustedly all night to catch some fish, and we have not caught anything. It's one thing to have a, a bad day where you get a little fish. Some of you know what it means. You go out and fish all day. Brother Marcus, it's good to see you. He fishes all the time. Yeah, it's one thing. Some fishermen just love being out there to fish even if they don't catch anything. But when you're a professional fisherman, it defines your ability to pay your debts, to bring food on the table, and to expand your business. And so it's a frustrating day. And Jesus said, I want you to cast them out. And have you ever had a bad day and someone gives you some advice? And you know you don't want to be rude. You don't want to be disrespectful. But you know that they have no idea what they're talking about. Now, Jesus, you're a good teacher. I love hearing what you have to say. But have you ever fished before? Because the word on the street is that you used to be a carpenter. Come on. Not a fisherman. And I've had a bad enough day already. I mean, it's amazing how Jesus will do that. You just lost some money in the Lord. And you're like, Lord, I need, some, I need you to help me out to cover that loss. And the Lord said, why don't you put an extra money of offering above your tithe Sunday? No, no, you don't understand. That will only make things. Now you know what Peter's thinking about. If I do this, it will only make things worse. Lord, we've been up all night. We've fished. We've caught nothing. But that's your command. That's your word. I don't understand it. And we can go all day into the other context of trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. You need trust, which means you obey beyond your understanding. At your command, I'll throw the net over. And he did, and the Bible says that when he did, what happened? There was a lot of fish. Now, I, I like to think of it, and there's different ways you, you can think that Jesus created all those fish in the moment, and that would be a cool miracle. I think of it this way. I think that Jesus began to call the fish to that spot before Peter let go of the net. 
So before, while Peter was, and we don't know how long this decision was going on, we don't know how long the conversation, but if Peter, I don't, I don't think Peter was one of these guys that said, sure, I'll do it. I, he began to argue with them. And during that conversation of Peter getting to a place of faith and obedience, fish were coming. So the miracle was happening behind the scenes before the miracle was seen by Peter. So while, I, I mean, if, it, if I was Jesus and I'm not, I would want, you know, I would want to say, Peter, you don't understand, I got 20,000 fish and they are on their way. They will be here in two minutes. They are not waiting for you. They will come. They will be right here. And if you don't obey at the moment you need to obey, they are going down the stream and you will miss an opportunity of a lifetime. Financially, ministry, the understanding who I am. Peter, you need to trust me. Just do it. Have you ever tried to talk somebody into it? And you're like, if you just trust me, this is what's going to happen. But Jesus says, trust me and don't tell you all that's going to happen because the true factor of trust is obeying even before you see it or feel it or know it thank you for the three of you i'll talk to you see these people over here so something i just messed all the camera guys up because i just did that little dart thing but anyway uh, so peter said, okay, and there was fish coming. I believe fish were coming from all over. I don't know where they came from, if they were sleeping, swimming, but somehow Jesus was able, and he did that later on. We see with the coin in, in the mouth of the fish, and that's another long story that's like, how in the world, but God is good. And so all these fish are showing up. Peter throws in the net, and he pulls up the net that had just been clean after a long, failing night of frustration and exhaustion. And he pulls up the net that he was cleaning, only to find out there's so much fish that the Bible says that the net was about to break. Now, if you understand, fishermen and nets, they are not weak nets. They are strong nets. And their nets are defined by, and strength is defined by how much fish they're planning on catching. So if you've got fish in there that's causing the net that you have as a fisherman to break, that tells me something. That tells me that more fish were in that net than Peter ever thought was capable or possible. So God was be so Jesus was, was bringing a miracle to Peter that was beyond his ability of ever planning for the miracle. And so the Bible tells us that Peter looked to the partners, the owners of the second boat, because there was two boats. How many boats? You guys are quick. How many boats? Two. All right. And so Peter called to the owners or the partners of the other boat and said, come help me. And you know what they did? Like any good business person, when you see a harvest like that, you go get it. Right? Some of you in the seasons of life and the rhythms of life will be the part of Peter's role and you'll be the one taking the step out. Some of you are supporting those taking the step out and when you see it, that you'll be called into action later. But, and that role will change based on the moment and who's actually God is using. But there'll be times that God will say, see that and you gotta go get it. And so they go out to the boat the second boat goes out, and as they're bringing in the net and the fish are coming in, the Bible says now that not only are the nets at the point of breaking, it says that the boats are at the point of sinking. Here again, we see the miracle of what God is doing because Peter obeyed in getting the gospel out. Jesus is rewarding him with his expertise beyond his understanding. Don't you love that? Where well, you think you're an expert, and Jesus says, let me show you something that you don't know. And brings them to a place of not only breaking the net, but sinking the boats. That means that the miracle, the blessing, happened to the point of their, catch this, of their ability to receive. Today I want to talk about this context. And I'm not, we're not going to talk about hearing the word of God to get direction and obeying the word of God in faith. That's, and these are key elements that we talk about a lot. But some of us in the church world have been reading the word, have been obeying the word, but the problem we're having is we're not able to receive the miracle. And the problem is because we're not prepared for the miracle. Let me say it this way. If the miracle process of Jesus was to maximize whatever Peter brought, net, boats, would the story be any different if Peter didn't have two boats available but had 20 boats available? 
Because we know in another place, in the Old Testament, where the prophet told the widow woman they had just a little bit of oil that wasn't enough to do anything, and the prophet told her sons, you go borrow from the neighbors, now take those containers, those bowls into the house, close the door behind you with your mom, and take the little pitcher, the little container of the little oil that doesn't do enough to help you or anybody, but I want you to begin to pour it, and as they poured it, the Bible says it began to supernaturally multiply, and when it supernaturally multiplied it began to fill the containers the first one and the second one and the third one and it said and it kept doing it until there was no more room which means until there was no more containers until there were no more empty containers the miracle happened to the place of their ability to receive I believe if Peter had 20 boats in 10 nets, every net and every boat would have been filled. What causes you and I from bringing the boats and the nets? How many boats and nets have you brought for Jesus to fill? In the area of your life, let's move beyond fishing. In the area of your life and you're believing and we, we get the scripture, we're praying, we're obeying. Have you prepared to receive the answer. I think this is a principle that's throughout Scripture if you begin to look for and begin to see it intertwined because for, for hundreds of years, they prayed and looked for the Messiah. And for the part of the Jewish community, they're still looking. The Orthodox Jews are still praying, looking for the Messiah. The Messianic Jews realized that Jesus was the Messiah. But before Jesus showed up, and the Bible says he came in the fullness of time. At the right time, right moment. But before he came, they sent John the Baptist. Why? 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 Because John the Baptist came, Jesus said, in the anointing. Of who? The anointing of Elijah. Do you remember the story? Elijah didn't die, went up in the whirlwind. And if you look at Malachi, most people talk Malachi chapter 3, they talk about tithes and offerings, but if you look at the end of Malachi, which is the last, which is the last part of the Old Testament, because after that, there was the dark ages, no new revelation, and at the end, it talks about the great and a terrible notable day where, where the Messiah is going to return, and said that before he comes, Elijah will come to prepare a way. Stay with me. And the disciples asked Jesus, what about this? And Jesus said, if you can handle this, John the Baptist came in the anointing, the spirit of Elijah. Why did John the Baptist come? He came to prepare the people for Jesus. He came to prepare the people for Jesus. If Jesus came in the, in the earthly suit of humanity... He needed someone to prepare the way. How can I say this, Lord? Help me. So it's like, well, it's Jesus. Why don't he just show up? He did show up. But before he showed up in ministry, he needed somebody to prepare the way. Well, with my miracle, why why don't my miracle just show up? Maybe you haven't prepared the place for your miracle. Maybe it's coming. Maybe it's evident. Maybe it's behind the scenes and you don't see it. Maybe it's sitting there right before you and you don't perceive it. And the problem is not, God, where, why are you holding it up? But many times the problem is we're not prepared. We need a gallon of an answer and we bring a Dixie cup to hold it. And we say, Jesus, I need something big. Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. Think of sports. In baseball, if a catcher who's, who's behind the plate, what is one of the things he does? Have you ever watched it real closely if you're into baseball? He's giving hand signals. Hand signals are defining, it's communicating to the, to the pitcher what kind of pitch the catcher is wanting. And so the catcher tells the pitcher, I want a certain pitch. And the pitcher, when he sees it, will nod, which says, I see it, I understand it, and I'm going to bring it to you. Fastball, slider, curveball, inside, on the outside, high, low, wherever he wants it, the type of pitch, the placement of the pitch, pitch out, whatever, wherever he wants it, he calls for the pitcher. And if the pitcher's good 
and delivers what's been requested, then if you watch the catcher, the catcher then, before the pitcher ever releases the ball, positions himself to receive what he's requested. If he goes for inside high, he's going to move to the inside high position. If he calls for a pitch out, the mo- he might do it with his glove, but the moment he releases it, he- he's out there to catch it. Wouldn't it be strange if he called for a pitch out and yet moved close inside and then blame the pitcher for his inability to receive what he's made a request? See, when you make a request to God and you do an alignment with the, the word and Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will and you shall have it. You have to understand, it. once you ask in alignment with the word, it belongs to you if you're in a position to receive it. You can't pray, God bless me and you've closed all opportunities of God blessing you. And you sit in an easy chair watching reality TV knowing that he's your your El Shaddai and he's more than enough and he's going to be your Jehovah Jireh, your provider, and he's going to pay your bills. And yet you do nothing. You haven't positioned yourself to receive. Because faith is more than just hearing and believing. Faith is obeying. Faith without works is dead, James says. And we have to learn to position ourselves to receive. How do I position myself to receive? I'm asking for this, and if I believe he's going to do it, I need. If I believe he's going to do it, I need. If I believe, Lord, my, my daughter's ran away, and I need, I'm praying that you bring her back home. If I, do, have you prepared the room for her? Lord, I'm believing that I can get out and start walking again. The doctors say I'll always be in crutches or wheelchair. Have you bought some shoes lately? Well, I don't need shoes right now. You're not buying for now. You're making room for the miracle. You're making room for the miracle. And the truth be told, we're good people, but sometimes we, the reason we don't make room for the miracle is because we become timid and afraid. If we fail, we'll look bad. God, I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to see this. I want to be more blessed. Are you making room for the miracle? I want to own my own business. Have you learned to handle the counts of a business? I want to have 20 employees instead of two. Well, that changes things. Do you have you learned how to manage and do a staff meeting? Things the, the world levels change things. And if you want to be at a level, you need to make sure that you're positioning yourself to handle. Because just like Joseph in the Old Testament, when his father, God knew that, Joseph, I'm going to use you to redeem, to to protect my people. He knew that there was a storm coming and that his people would starve unless they were brought in. And so he set Joseph up to be the second most powerful person in the world, second to Pharaoh himself who had conquered the known world. But Joseph wasn't ready. Joseph learned, learned the hard way. And you can learn the hard way, or you can learn from the, the mistakes of other people. Because Joseph, when he was a young Joseph, was so full of pride that when his father gave him a coat with several colors in it, he thought he was just it. He was so full of pride. Look, look brothers, what I got. But when the Joseph of where God was taking him, It was a Joseph that wasn't in pride, even when he wore the coat of Pharaoh. And it wasn't because of the hard things. Most people take that, say, you've got to go through some hard times. No, you just got to learn. If you want to learn through hard things, go through it. But you learn through the word of God. The Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But folks, if we're not positioning ourselves to receive, oh, I believe God's going to help me double sales. But you're not making any calls. Well, they're just, do you think they're actually just going to call and fall into your lap? Figure out how to, God will show you a better way. It's very spiritual and yet very practical. But the problem is, in the context of who we are, if we're not bold, if we're not strong within ourselves, we'll never bring 20 boats. We'll settle for two. And we'll have two full boats, and that's an amazing miracle. 
Well, how much more if we would have brought 20? They were cleaning their nets, but they only threw out one. Jesus said, throw out your nets. And the, then you see it says, Peter threw out a net. What if you would have thrown them all out? It takes some confidence. How do we get that confidence? How do we build that? How do we strengthen our net? How do we get that boldness so that we can prepare ourselves to take those steps necessary for God to bring us to where God wants to bring us? Let me, throw, let me read a verse. I'm going to read it differently. I'm going to read this in reverse. So if you have your Bibles, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Verse 8. Joshua 1, verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. I want you to know what God is talking to Joshua and saying, I want you to be successful and prosperous. That doesn't mean you have to be a billionaire. Although I'd like for some of you to be a billionaire. Tithing bil billionaires, come on somebody. Amen. Tithing millionaire, can I get an amen? amen. But it look at this. And this is part money, but you can have money and still not be prosperous and successful. If you hate life and you want to commit suicide because everything's falling apart, even though you've got a big bank account, you're not successful. You should have good success, be prosperous. Notice, you will make that happen. How do I make it happen? How do, how, why am I responsible for this? Folks, we have to be responsible for the destiny that God's given us. Too many Christians, in my opinion, put all the burden on God and none on themselves. And if it wasn't bad enough, then they'll write a few songs and say, Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, don't want the wheel. <laughs> it makes you feel good that he's got the wheel, but he, not, he don't have the wheel. He don't want the wheel. What do you mean he don't want the wheel? He wants you to sit there with the wheel and you to hear from heaven what you're supposed to do. And then you obey what you hear from heaven. We've got to put the responsibility back on us. And if, if you're not where you think you need to be or should be, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's life. Welcome to the party. We're all in it. It's a race. You haven't finished it until you get to heaven. Hebrews 12, run the race set before you. Let's walk it out. Don't stop there. Don't get in a pity party. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't feel bad. Don't dog yourself. Wake yourself up. Begin to rise and shine, Isaiah, for the light has come. Start where you're at. Start today. Don't wait till someday down the road. Start today. I've lost so many years. You can't change the past. You can change the future. Start today. Dust yourself up. Let's keep going step by step, inch by inch, mile by mile, and you're going to get somewhere. But don't give the responsibility to somebody else. It's yours. Say, it's mine. See, you have the authority. Jesus said, what you bind and loose will be, what you tolerate and don't tolerate. It's quiet. Okay. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate it day and night. Notice the power of the word. Get the word in your heart. Romans says faith comes by hearing. Hebrews 6 says that faith is what enables you to receive from God. 1 John chapter 5 says in your faith gives you victory. He's the born of God, overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes your world, even your faith. The reason we do meetings like with Jonathan and we start doing it is because there's such an impact. It's not Jonathan, it's not Hope Church, it's the word. And have an opportunity to sit under the word that much. And when you sit under the word that much, no matter who you are, it begins to create a change. Matthew 13, it's like a seed that produces fruit. And it's not overnight, but in the process of time, it will bring a change that cannot be stopped by the enemy or others. It's a, it's a changing of your, your attitude and heart. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the power of the word. And you can't do this all the time. None of us can, unless this is what you're called to do. Because we have jobs and responsibilities and families and life to deal with. But you need to have, Jesus had seasons where he was, he was in the presence of God, in the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate there in day and night. Then you, then you will observe. Notice what happens as I'm hearing the word. Faith comes. What is that faith? The revelation by the Holy Spirit of the word that you're hearing becomes alive to you. What does that give you? A direction for you to do. Then, then, then you shall. Then you shall. Observe to do according to all that is written. Then you're going to see, you're going to perceive what you need to do. So when I hear the word, I can get a revelation. And not every time you hear the word, you're going to get a revelation. But if you're never in the word, you'll never get a revelation. But as I saturate my heart and my mind with the word of God, I'm going to get a, revela a revelation, a perception, and an instruction out of that. 
I begin to see it differently. And as I obey that, I'm making my way prosperous. How does that affect us? Notice this. Notice this. Stay with me. Verse 7. We'll read it in reverse. Only be strong and courageous that you may observe to do according to the law. You can't be a sissy and obey the word of God. People that say, oh, Christians, they just need a crutch. They're just weak. No, no. You can't be weak and obey God's word. You need to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Why? Because Christians that are obeying the word of God aren't limited based on what they feel, hear, or see. They're limited by what God has says, and they're willing to obey. And you will never obey until you get some guts to yourself, some boldness. Did you hear me? The righteous are what? Bold as a lion. And so how do I get that boldness? Notice that be strong and very courageous that you may observe. How do, the earlier, the verse we read just before this told us how to get the observation of the word, and that's by hearing the word. So as I'm hearing the word, I'm going to observe it. But as I'm hearing the word, I'm going to get bold about it. Have you ever been in the word, all of a sudden you've just got that peace and that strength and that confidence, and you're like, man, I, this week's going to be a great week, and I'm going to, and I, man, I know God's got to control, and you're excited, you're strong, you're bold, and within three days, things start weakening. Things didn't happen as fast, and now you're starting to question it. What happened? Because you didn't stay in the Word. Have you ever, have you ever eaten a good meal? I love eating good food. I'll eat bad food, too, because I enjoy eating. But, I mean, I like eating really good. You know what I'm saying? Really good food. Food that when that meal, you get done with it, you feel so satisfied. Have you ever, ever had those meals? I mean, it's just it, more than just fast food. I mean, a good meal. But you can have the best meal, and you're satisfied, and you feel ex- you're just happy. I mean, I've eaten some ribs before. And I have sauce in my face. I don't care. I'm just so happy. You know what? I'm happy. You don't care what people are thinking about you at that point. But you know what? If I go a few days without eating, I'm no longer full. I'm no longer content. What's my problem? And you would say, Pastor, you ate a great meal, but don't stop there. You've got to keep eating to get the effect, to get the results. How many of you went to school? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many of you that went to school, you got 100% on every test? Anybody? Let's be honest. Okay. All right. Let me, let me, math, English, science, history. You know what? These are important topics. But you, you, you listening? These topics will not make eternal difference. Now, I'm not against education. I believe in education. Okay? But those subjects, English, math, history, science, they will not change your eternity They don't carry the power of God. Can you agree with me on that? Good information, but they don't care. With that that being said, the devil doesn't care if you learn algebra, right? Or English or history or science. He don't care. And so he has no opposition of you learning math or English or history or science. And yet without the opposition of the enemy... We have a teacher, we have a book, textbook, we take notes, and we study, and we still don't get 100% without opposition. What am I saying? The challenge is that sometimes we're so flippant with the word of God, and we think that, oh, it should just happen, it will happen. But if you didn't get an A with no opposition, Matthew 13 says that the enemy, it gives you direct opposition from understanding the word of God. See, you can't be passive with the things in the word of God and expect God's word to change your life. Because the enemy's tactic, Matthew 13, is to steal the understanding so it doesn't go into your heart, so you can't obey it, so it doesn't bring a change. And when you're like, oh, I I studied, I worked, and yet we spend no time studying the word of God. We don't take notes. We just kind of flip it with it. I'm glad. They should be glad I even showed up. I put $5 in the offering. That should be good enough. And uh, and I I, I read one of those scriptures on the screen. That should be good enough. And that's fine. That's between you and Jesus. You can still make it to heaven, but you'll never have God's power from his word actively changing your world. 
And it's not because Jesus don't love you. It's not because you're not important. It's not because the God doesn't have greater things. It's because you have to be serious with this word to see this word bring, bring serious change in your life. Because this word has opposition from the devil to keep you from understanding. That's why faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing because you could hear it once and you don't remember it because you've got to keep he hearing it, keep feeding on it. Did you hear me? See, you missed that pun. But anyway, come on. And you're doing a great job, but we need to be serious about that. And as we meditate on the word, guess what it's going to bring? Strength and courage. And if you ever are getting ready to fight a battle and you feel nervous or panicky or uh, kind of questioning or uncertain, stop. Don't go to war. Let me help you. Don't go to war. Don't go to war. Don't make the decision. Don't sign your name on the contract. Don't say, I do at the altar. Don't buy what you have to pay 30 years for. Don't go, don't say to the doctor whatever you think is best. If you don't have that confidence on the inside, don't make any decision because you'll get your teeth knocked out. You're not in a place of strength. For you to fight a battle, you have to fight. For you to win in a battle, you have to fight from a position of strength. Am I helping anybody today? We get people who grasp a one verse in passing and say, I sure hope that works. And then you go to war with no armor. Why am I losing? Well, it's not Einstein. It's not rocket science. No weapon. Probably not going to win. You go in the battles of life with no confidence and no boldness. You have no faith because you have no word. And therefore, you'll not be prepared to bring what's necessary and position yourself that's necessary. Sure, we have our wish list. Sure, man, I deal. If I could hit a button, it'd be perfect. This would all happen. But we don't prepare ourselves with it. We lack confidence. Because you have to be bold to bring 20 boats. You have to be bold to throw out all the nets. You have to be bold to make, not foolish decisions, decisions that are revealed from the word of God. Because you have to be bold and you won't be bold unless you're in the word. And the word gives you boldness. Only be strong. Only be strong. And correct, very courageous that you may observe to do according to all of the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from the right hand to the left that you may prosper. God said, I'm going to do the impossible, but you have to do what you can do. And you have to be in the word enough to build the faith and the boldness and the peace and the rest. And I'm going into surgery and I just pray, Lord, help me make it through. You're not in faith. If you want us to agree with you in faith, get to a point of faith. What do you want? Get in the word. How much? What scripture are you believing for? Well, I'm believing that, that he heals today. What's the verse? If you don't have a chapter and a verse, you don't have a word and it's not alive to you. But when you are in it, day and night, in it, day and night, it'll become a part of you. It's the engrafted word of God. Have you ever had a skin graft? That means they take it from one place and put it in another place, and that becomes skin there for you. It's engrafted. I used to be weak here, but now it's got the grafting of God's word, and I'm strong. Last verse, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people you will divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers. What is he saying? Get in the word. Build your faith. Build your confidence. Because what I'm about to do, I can't have you timid. God is not giving you a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and sound mind. I need you to be strong because I'm going to bless you. As I instruct you to obey, you act upon that. That will bring you in a position of success to the place of you sharing that success with other people because it doesn't end with you. What I've called, I've got my word on the line and it's a promise I have made to others and it's a part of a covenant that's bigger and greater than you. But if you participate in what I'm doing, you're gonna come out ahead and I'm gonna use you to bring other people to a greater place. Amen? Amen? Get the word. Become bold. Say, I'm bold. I'm strong. I'm courageous. Because of the word. 
reveals to you who you are. It works, folks. It doesn't work because you, it should work or because you occasionally walk by it. It works because you, the violent take it by force. You go after it. Amen? Amen. We're done. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise.